planet Earth. At some point during our short lives, all of us turn inwards and contemplate the nature of the Earth we inhabit. From childhood, we are taught about the Earth, the Sun, the Moon and space. We learn about our solar system and the planets within it. We learn about the Milky Way and the infinite vastness of space. And we accept these teachings as fact and go about our busy daily lives. One day, I decided I wanted to know more about our world and universe. I wanted to know everything, so I started digging. But straight away, I started to bump into things that made me stop and think, hmm, here are a few of those things. Did you know that our spherical Earth is spinning in space at a rate of over a thousand miles an hour? And that the Earth rotates the Sun at over 67,000 miles per hour, causing us to hurtle through the Milky Way galaxy at over 500,000 miles per hour? And all the while the Milky Way is expanding at the speed of light, zooming at roughly 670 million miles per hour. Mind dazzling, isn't it? And yet not one single human on Earth can actually feel this motion. We can feel the motion on a roller coaster, a train, we get car sickness, and when we fall our entire body feels a rush, but we feel not one aspect of the Earth's daily journey through the cosmos. That's weird. We've all seen images of Earth from space. In 1972, NASA released the first whole image of Earth, as seen from space. Titled the Blue Marble, one can only feel amazement at its perfect spherical shape and feel the immense enormity of the silent nothingness that surrounds our Blue Marble. But did you know that the Blue Marble image and every subsequent image of the Earth released by NASA are composite images, developed by computers out of data and finalized in Photoshop? There are no whole images of the Earth as seen from space. Who would have thought? And then there's gravity. Einstein theorized that gravity exists due to the curvature of space that results from a massive object and it is the force that keeps us all rooted to the Earth. And gravity is so strong that it has the power to keep all our oceans strictly bound to the Earth and the power to curve them over our spinning planet. But it is not strong enough, however, to keep the birds from gliding through the skies, to stop feathers floating in the air and balloons rising. Hmm, I guess gravity's power is a selective one. As I looked into space and physics more, I had more and more questions. And I knew that somebody much smarter than me out there had the answers. But it wasn't just space that fascinated me. I wanted to learn about the biological and geographical nature of our world. And again, as I dived into learning, I found more weird things that puzzled me. It's basic biology that living cells consist primarily of hydrogen and carbon. And water consists primarily of oxygen and hydrogen. But biologists found the strangest of anomalies in the poles of the Earth that even puzzled Soviet biologists. They found an unnatural amount of water frozen in the ice and an unusually high percentage of carbon dioxide in the world's oceans. There is a lot of water, snow and ice on the Earth. Do you know what this anomaly tells us? It tells us of a great worldwide fire in the Earth's history that biologists have suggested carried away 99% of the world's biosphere. What really puzzles me is that figure, 99%. That means that everything alive on Earth is now 20,000 times less in volume and the biochemical mass of all living things is much less than before this huge fire. Wait, what? What did the living things look like before that fire? There's no doubt that we could benefit from extensive scientific study in our poles. But did you know that Antarctica is the only continent on Earth that actually belongs to nobody? In 1959, the nations of the world signed the UN Treaty ensuring that no country has claim to Antarctica. The treaty prohibits and regulates all global activity on the continent. 
Wait, come again? Since when has any nation given up their drive to own and exploit any land on Earth? I kept researching, which just opened up question after question. Some things just didn't make sense to me, and it seemed that many pieces of the larger puzzle were missing or just unanswered. And then I stumbled on something so ridiculous and absurd, I did not know whether to laugh or become angry. Meet the Flat Earth Society, a group of like-minded individuals that hypothesize that the Earth is not actually a globe in a vast and evolving universe, but a flat and stationary plane. At first I thought it was a joke, or some kind of vigilant, religious and creationist denial of scientific advancement. Humanity lived in the dark ages for years and we finally have objective, progressive science advancing our understanding of this great mystery and flat earthers think it's okay to promote such anti-scientific theories. <sighs> Nonetheless, I thought I'd check it out before dismissing it completely. In fact, I just wanted a good laugh and some entertainment to keep boredom at bay. But, you see, despite all my skepticism and desire to debunk and ridicule these flat earthers, what I found was nothing short of astonishing. I had finally found something that challenged my scientific understanding of the world, not just with theory, but also strong scientific evidence. I want to share this with you. Come with me, if you will, down this rabbit hole to discover whether our Earth is, in fact, a flat and stationary plane. I only ask one thing before we begin. Keep an open mind until the end of this series and question absolutely everything. I promise you this. At the end, you will certainly agree that everything we have been told about our planet is not exactly what it seems. You may even find that your entire perspective on the world has changed, like mine has. And I warn you, this rabbit hole is deep and perhaps at times a little troubling but we'll take it one step at a time. And hey, who knows, maybe we'll even get to meet Alice on her way to Wonderland. Follow me now to part two of What on Earth Happened. Here is a beautiful image of Alex Gleason's 1892 New Standard Map of the World that was on projection at Modern College in Blackheath, England. It states at the top of the map that it is scientifically and practically correct. The way Gleason's map significantly differs from standard maps of the world is in its representation of the poles. As you can see by comparison with a conventional world map, the primary difference in Gleason's map is that the North Pole is actually situated in the center of the Earth, and upon first glance the South Pole, or what is known as Antarctica, appears to be missing. Upon closer inspection, however, you realize that Antarctica is indeed present and makes up the majority of landmass on the map. Antarctica in Gleason's map is an encompassing ice ring that covers the entire outer reaches of Earth. Gleason's map has become somewhat of a canonical historical document for flat earthers. Many often reposting the image on the internet and heralding it as solid proof that refutes the heliocentric model of the Earth. Or in other words, proving that the Earth is not a spinning globe in space, but a circular, flat and stationary plane. This was not enough proof for me. And while I gravitated towards the idea of a giant encompassing an ice wall as a neat concept, I knew that we had a vast amount of evidence proving the existence of space, spherical planets, and entire science is dedicated to solving the mathematical conundrums of physics. I mean, we landed on the moon for God's sake. Surely, if the Earth was flat and stationary, then somebody would have realized by now. These brave souls did the unthinkable. They flew to the moon, they landed, took their first cautionary steps and planted the American flag. NASA sent multiple crews to the moon on subsequent Apollo missions. They even managed to film Apollo 17 leaving the moon. Four days, Mission Army Death Okay, I'm going to get the pro. 99, proceeded. 3, 2, 1, go. Okay, Mission Army Death Match. 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 Okay, Mission Army
Hold on. If this is footage of the crew leaving the moon and making the journey back to Earth, then who did they leave behind to film their craft take off? And wait, don't you think those colorful emissions on takeoff look kind of fake? I haven't seen any subsequent rockets produce these sort of dazzling colors. And I suppose they did admit that they had lost all their data from the mission. But maybe that was just coincidence. I started looking into NASA a bit more closely and what I found was shocking. I can say with certainty that NASA is indeed lying to the world and has been lying ever since its founding in 1958. But don't take my word for it. Sometimes you can't tell people the truth, you have to show them. So let me show you. Buckle up and sit tight because Houston, we have a big problem. Okay, well, um, there's a big problem with the blue marble, and I'm going to zoom in here and show you what the problem is. These are all composite images where they are really not very good at Photoshop because they're using the Photoshop clone tool to replicate clouds. This cloud is a copy of this cloud. See the formations? They're identical. Identical formations. These right here, side by side, side by side. See, see this kind of W-looking shape right here, replicated right here. This cloud is exactly the same as that cloud. Um, you know, same clouds right there, and same thing on the other side of the world. They got the same thing going on. They, they got careless here. Look, one, two, three, four, five, the same formations replicated right there. These two replicated, same exact formations right here. Um, this right here is, is clone of that right there. I mean, really? So you're telling me that we could take pictures of Jupiter and Saturn, huge, massive planets, and now we're out going to Pluto, but we don't have one legitimate picture of the Earth from space that's not a composite? Click on this picture right here. Supposedly the same mission, same guys that took the picture, the most famous picture of our Earth. I'm going to do save image as... And let's see, Apollo Moon, let's call it Apollo Moon 17. And I'm gonna open that in Photoshop. And if those of you think this technical difficulty was planned and think I'm scamming you, go do it for yourself. Because <laughs> you're gonna find the exact same thing. I got nothing to hide here. This is live on the air, okay? I'm gonna zoom in on the Earth in Photoshop. You see the Earth? Go to image, adjust levels and I'm going to bring the levels over here and I'm going to bring the levels up uh oh what is that why is there a square box around the earth allegedly taken from the scientists on the moon in Apollo 17 and people wonder why I don't trust NASA that's why I don't trust NASA just another example of NASA faking space. Take a look here at this supposed image of Jupiter. It's nothing more than CGI fakery. The supposed auroras towards the north. Let's take a look here. Again, at NASA's official website where it states Hubble captures vivid auroras in Jupiter's atmosphere. Here's the problem. The date of June 30th, 2016. Now take a look at this. Another so-called official image of Jupiter. This one's from back in 2014. You see the problem here? Now let's take a closer look at the supposed two images provided from NASA of Jupiter. Here's the problem again, 2016, 2014. What's the difference here? Well, the difference is they added the supposed auroras on the north. And this is nothing but a Christmas tree. Give me a break, take a look here. I mean, all the clouds are in the same exact position. Just the 2016 image is a bit, I would say darker, it's a bit lighter in 2014. Here's a side by side. People can't see what's taking place here with NASA. Nothing more than fakery. I mean, give me a break. This is, this is a complete insult. You have a brain in your head. And you can tell it's real because it looks so fake, honestly. <laughs>
it became instantly clear how they do it. And it's just video game technology. Now, if you're part of the geek squad or the techie crowd, well, then you've you already know about this technology. And so let's get to the video that caught my attention and you will see the same things that I saw. Let's watch. We have to introduce the concept of freefall. So let's use this model. Of so what is significant about this video is number one, it was live to school children. Number two, we have this stuffed animal that is transitioning in on another video channel. And the actor is able to reach up and grab this doll in real 3D space and manipulate this doll with their hands. And so the only way you're gonna pull that off is with one technology. And that technology is virtual reality. More importantly though, something called augmented virtual reality. It's taking the objects in 3D space from a virtual reality world and putting them in our world on another screen, which we can see, manipulate, and touch with virtual reality contacts or glasses. In this next segment, I'm gonna show you how NASA grabs objects in 3D space, rotates them around, manipulates them. They can do this with water, with cloth, anything. And the cool thing about it is we can take what they're doing, what they're seeing with their contact virtual reality augmented lenses and put that on a separate video layer live. Yes, live. And do it all in real time. Oh, 45 minutes straight of NASA messing up the virtual reality setup. I tried to pick some clips that were obvious and some not so obvious. Uh, show you some of the contacts. We're going to see um, Tim Peake with his contacts in, but these are virtual reality contacts overlaid on the eyes so actors can interact with things in 3D space all in real time. In this next shot, we will get to see the whole arm set up and the virtual reality glove that covers all the way down the arm and hand. This allows the software to broadcast what we see video wise as his arm in a shirt sleeve. Okay, I have a lot of Tim Peake screw-ups, but this one here, the system glitches, the software does not track his hand properly, and Tim slips his hand underneath his other fingers, which is tightly holding onto the mic, which would be impossible. Um, I don't think this is Tim's fault. Normally, Tim always moves his other fingers up while he slides his hand under. I just think the uh, system didn't respond to his movements here. They're wearing augmented uh, contact lenses so that they can interact with these 3D objects. Now in this scene, the guy on the left in the green shirt, he thinks he sees an object in 3D space that's being broadcast to him. So he grabs it and he puts it off to the side. He's looking straight ahead because he's looking at an object rotating in front of him, but the video channel is down that is supposed to show the viewers what we're supposed to see and so we don't actually get to see the object that he has seen. And I would just sum this up as a very terrible, bad, horrible day for NASA doing live feeds. So, on January 3rd, 2018, there was a major malfunction on what's called the International Space Station. In a video on NASA's YouTube channel called Space Station Crew Members Discuss Life in Space with the Media, the three actronauts, <clears throat> excuse me, astronauts, all disappear simultaneously while the background layer of the ISS remains intact. Thank you very much again. Uh, thank you for your time. Have a good flight and uh, many more exciting experiments on the orbit. Thanks a lot. This is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. When you look at this thing, this thing, this, and the actors, they are the only things that mess up. Watch closely.
This is a big deal because it means without any doubt whatsoever that there was live editing and video manipulation. Not only would the background get scrambled as well, but these guys wouldn't all disappear at the same time. Hello. Hello. Been here once before. Nice to meet you? you. Good. How are you? Cupolo, which is one of the, the windows we have. And that's a picture of Washington, D.C. Some NASA actors say that you can totally see stars when you're in space. Whilst in space, have you ever looked away from Earth into the black void? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah, because yeah, you time. can see yeah, because yeah. you can see the stars. Oh yeah. yeah. You know, and, and uh, pretty much all the time you can see yeah. the stars. Yeah. It's, it's not a black a cool void. Thing. I mean, it's black, but there's all kinds of little polka dots. There's all the there's all the stars there, and the cool thing is about it, you can see it during the day. Yeah, you can, and there's more than stars. You can see planets. You can right. see moons. You, you see the ga the gas. Uh, Magellan clouds of yeah, the Milky yeah, Way galaxy. Yeah, yeah, you see Magellanic clouds. Magellanic, see, I, was, yeah. I just wanted the well, Magellan clouds. Well, there's a large clouds. one and a small one, right? But the NASA actors from 1969 say that you can't see the stars in space. We were never able to see stars from the lunar surface or on the daylight side of the moon by eye without looking through the optics. Uh, I don't recall during the period of time that we were photographing the Sona Corolla what, uh, what stars we could see. I don't remember seeing any. You can see the stars. Oh yeah. yeah. You know, and, and uh, pretty much all the time you can see yeah. the stars. I don't remember seeing any. Right now. We only can fly in Earth orbit. That's the farthest that we can go. The kinds of technologies that we're testing out on Space Station are definitely helping us with our goals of going beyond low Earth orbit. Early in the next decade, a set of crewed flights will test and prove the systems required for exploration beyond low Earth orbit. And this is really the beginning, I think, of human beings leaving low Earth orbit. I'd go to the moon in a nanosecond. Uh, the problem is we don't have the technology to do that anymore. We used to, but we uh, destroyed that technology and uh, it's a painful process to build it back again. Euro's question. <laughs> That's my question. I want to know what I think I know. Because we didn't go there and and that's the way it happened. And and if it didn't happen, it's nice to know why it didn't happen. Because we didn't go there and during um, spacewalks outside the International Space Station. We can see air bubbles rising up. Can you touch on how there are air bubbles in space? 
Um, air, can you be more specific, air bubbles? So yeah, like a lot of times during the footage, the NASA footage, you can see bubbles coming up out of the helmets or kind of from underneath you. Um, how do you explain bubbles in space? Yeah, I, I'm not sure exactly what you're talking about. You might, there's, now sometimes you get water in the helmet and it comes, it's either, it's either, uh, you know, from sweat or from the cooling garments. And, um, you know, on some of my spacewalks, I had like water in the helmet, not like I was going to drown in the helmet, but just little bits of water probably came from uh, sweat. Often um, on the outside of the space station, you'll liberate little pieces of, um, you know, there, it's a really harsh environment out there, and the outside of the space station gets beat up pretty good. And sometimes, you know, you'll see just little flecks of paint or something that you might have disrupted floating away from the suit. And, uh, you know, that's generally what that is. I've never seen any kind of air bubble anywhere. Yeah. Could it, could it be that you're filming in an underwater pool and you're not really out there? <laughs>
You Mr. Kelly? Yeah. Oh, yeah? You don't remember the question from Tampa about the bubbles in space coming up from the helmets? No. Yeah, you guys are in an underwater pool, remember? <laughs> we know. Just remember. All right. Uh, that's about all the time we have. I, I got to implore upon you um, group somersault. Can you do one for me? Yeah, no problem. I think we can do that, right? <laughs> That's certainly not uh, as graceful as it could have been. That's why we usually hesitate to do those, but well, it's uh, certainly fun to do. I got to say, uh, at least you're having some fun up there. You're not going to the Olympics with that. Keep, keep the day jobs, guys. And then there is this, official NASA research into the dynamics of an aircraft that would function over a flat and non-rotating Earth. A flat and non-rotating Earth. What? I know NASA has a tremendous multi-billion dollar budget, but why would the organization waste funding research for an aircraft that functions over a flat and stationary Earth? I thought we lived on a spinning globe in space. This is all fun and games until you really start to ponder NASA's lies. Why would the biggest space organization whose vision statement on their website claims that it is their goal to discover and expand knowledge for the benefit of humanity lie. And where exactly does their multi-billion dollar annual budget go? In the last five years, NASA's total annual budget between 2016 and 2020 totals over a whopping $100 billion. Why would they commit such fraudulent actions if they want to benefit humanity with their understanding and exploration of space? And if we cannot trust the most famous of all space organizations to give us the truth, then is the Earth really what we've been led to believe it is? And then I remember the 1959 United Nations Treaty which prohibits and regulates all global activity on the continent of Antarctica and ensures that the continent belongs to no nation. With Gleason's map in mind, I started to wonder whether Antarctica was really what we had been told it was. Was it really a freezing white untouched paradise where, as Sir David Attenborough shows us, penguins play in the snow? Could it really be a huge ice wall encompassing the entire Earth? And then something dawned on me and stopped me in my tracks. How did I not notice? It was staring me in the face the whole time. Gleason's map. Hidden in plain sight in the United Nations logo. Look. The North Pole is at the center, just like Gleason's map. And why is Antarctica missing? Or is it? Upon closer inspection, I realized that the logo was framed in a circular laurel. I know from ancient Greek mythology that the laurel leaf came to symbolize Apollo. Apollo again, just like the moon missions. Hmm. In ancient Rome, the laurel was not permitted for profane uses and lighting it at the fires of the altar was strictly forbidden. And I knew from the treaty that the UN had strictly forbidden Antarctica from being explored and exploited. Was there a message in this? 
I started digging and then I realized that not only did the United Nations have this logo, but also the International Maritime Organization, the International Civil Aviation Organization, and the World Health Organization. The Maritime Organization polices the seas and the Aviation Organization polices the skies. The World Health Organization controls all health and disease communications and guidance for the world, much like it has during the COVID-19 pandemic. Did the UN's military really police Antarctica with the maritime and aviation, or is it just an arbitrary treaty honoring the last unspoiled place on Earth? Be a fucking international headline in about five minutes. <laughs> Australian Navy ship drifts. Bad boys, bad boys. Is it? The turret is turning our way. The turret's turning at us. Wait, we should hide Adrian in case they think we're trying to kill him. This is crazy. Just, just go. Just go. That's a drone. Is it? Set up a demo today with this Cessna and the Air National Guard. I'm going to be inside of this Cessna and we're going to be going rogue. We're gonna fly into that no-fly zone and we're gonna see how the Air National Guard does it. They scramble the fighter jets that come right Take off, we're on. Flying for miles and miles until... Okay, we've just entered the no-fly zone now. Our pilots aren't talking to air traffic control, ignoring their calls to reach them. That triggers an alarm at the Air National Guard base. These fighter pilots scrambling to their jets they're on alert and ready to take action 24 hours a day. Today, racing to their F-16s, suiting up, climbing on board, and rushing to the runway. Taking off to intercept our rogue Cessna, reaching the target in just minutes. This is the view from the F-16. That's my Cessna right there. Intimidating as you would think it would be. Look at that fighter jet, he's right off our wing. Another F-16 swooping in on the right, calling us on aviation frequencies. You have to intercept it if you hear this transmission. Dive to the radio call and rock your way. He wants us to identify ourselves. We're a rogue aircraft, remember, for this demonstration, so we're not going to respond at all and see what this fighter jet is. ordered to turn to the northwest. The fighter jet giving us one last warning. After all of this, the pilots still won't listen. The plane won't leave the airspace. Will you shoot them down? If required, we'll execute the rules of engagement for the commander of the North American Aerospace Defense Command. And yes, we would do that. Shoot the plane down. If it meets the rules of engagement, yes, we would to defend the airspace. Why are they policing the parameters of Antarctica in such a vigilant way? Surely they are just protecting the penguins and seals that we've seen so often in Planet Earth and Frozen Planet documentaries. I don't know. I'm not too sure anymore. Because after I stumbled across this.
a giant ice wall stretching for what seems to be hundreds and hundreds of miles. I don't know about you, but I find this footage deeply disturbing. With NASA's lies in mind and that great ice wall looming in the distance, I began to experience what some call cognitive dissonance. I went into denial. Of course none of this could be true, and of course our Earth is a spinning globe as we've been taught throughout our lives. It's one thing NASA lying, but are all the professors and scientists lying too? Is the National Geographic Channel lying? And what about Newton, Einstein, Hawking and Attenborough, are they lying too? It's a complicated answer, and I will do my best to show you the truth. But before we look at the gatekeepers of knowledge and the trusted voices of our world, I need to show you more of our Earth. I don't want to lose you just yet. Come with me to part three, where we will explore a few ways our Earth could work as a flat and stationary plane.